Hello and welcome to the Idaho Reports podcast. I'm Logan Finney. Joining us this week is Senate Minority Leader Melissa Wintrow from Boise to talk about Senate Bill 1234, a bill she sponsored on contraceptives and insurance coverage. Senator Wintrow, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Doesn't that have a nice ring? One, two, three, four. It's kind of like Gloria Estefan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will admit, uh, I'm not a super superstitious guy, but when I saw this bill was labeled 1234, I thought, oh, that might means she has a good chance of getting it across the finish line this year. I know, I love every time the uh, session starts and we see all the bills come out and all the numbers. Um, it's, it is actually quite funny because some of them get 666 and, you know, they don't always, you know. Random chance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about 1234, this bill that you sponsored. It has to do with birth control and contraceptives. Can you just explain for us first what the bill does? Yeah, the bill is very simple. It allows somebody to get their prescription contraception for up to six months at a time. So right now, most insurers only provide one month or three months supply of your birth control. And that means you have to go to the pharmacy a lot more, wait in lines and those kind of things. I noticed that during COVID, right? And this would allow somebody to get, you know, go to the, the pharmacy twice a year instead of 12 times or even four times. And that's really beneficial. We're leading busy lives, taking care of our kids and adult parents and working a couple jobs. And this is something that's important to take every day at the same time. So why not increase access? Because, you know, if you increase access, you increase adherence and you increase the actual success of the um, actual medication. So yeah, effectiveness. And a lot of the debate and not even debate, but discussion on the floor in both chambers about this bill was the fact that these types of medications are not just used to prevent someone from getting pregnant. There's all sorts of healthcare applications. Right. I mean, the you know, the first and foremost, we think of birth control, but um, they're used most commonly for people with painful periods and other medical conditions. So, again, making that easily accessible is really helpful. And I think in today's world, it's, you know, as I said in committee, there's there's a medical reason, a business reason, and there's a human reason. And the human reason should really be enough, and that's to support women and our busy daily lives and we're the ones having babies and kids and we're the ones at the heart of family planning so why not make our lives just a little bit easier and I think that should you know have sold on its own but of course I had some other reasons why we should pass it. <laughs> so now that this bill has been signed into law it was signed by Governor Little earlier um, so now an Idaho woman going to the pharmacy she'll be able to get six months at once. In your discussions with stakeholders working on this legislation, talking with the insurance companies, why isn't that something that they're largely doing on their own already? Why, why, why go to the point of doing a statute about it? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes um, what kind of dawned on me when I was doing this bill is the insurance companies actually did not oppose it, which I think is really important to understand. Um, and so that should have been a green light to most of my colleagues who really don't want to tell businesses what to do. But I think something like insurance and other um, business activities, if one person does it or one company does it and the rest don't, it could have a destabilizing effect. So sometimes maybe markets just need a nudge to say we're all going to jump at the same time. And that may be, in this case, what would be helpful for insurance companies is here's a law, a bill that says everybody's going to jump at the same time and everybody's got to do it this, at the same time. So. Maybe that's a reason, but you'd have to ask the insurers themselves. I don't know why they wouldn't do it themselves. Your colleagues in this building are, as you referenced, always hesitant to step on private business and tell private industry what to do. Mm -hmm. um, this is not the first version of this bill. It's far from it. There were earlier attempts going back several sessions uh, before you were even in the Senate to get something like this across the finish line. Can you talk to me about the legislative history about this issue that specifically the Democrats from District 19 have been pushing for a few years? Yes, yes, and pardon me for my little cold today that my voice sounds funny. But yes, I said it in committee, we started working on this bill in 2018 and I had some really great partners in Planned Parenthood and other stakeholder groups that really helped. And Sheree Buckner Webb, who was a senator at the time in District 19, was the first person to carry the bill in um, 2018, excuse me, and 2019. And both times it got stopped, I think the first time in committee and the second time on the Senate floor. And when I came to the Senate, I decided I'm going to try it again. 
And I went back and watched all the testimony. I read all the minutes and I tried to gather up every single reason people said they didn't vote for it. And I got stakeholders together and I put every reason in the bill to try to draw them away and from those. Important to note that first version was 12 months as well, a full right. year's coverage. Right, and I actually tried one year. The first year I did it, I had it for 12 months and it died on the Senate floor. And people kept citing the reason that it was just too many months. So the next time I came back and said, let's try six. I'll take, I mean, anything's better than what we have, and that's at least one step closer. So I tried six months and that worked. And in fact, in committee, I told folks, look, in 2018, I was on birth control, and it's been so long now, I'm on hormone therapy, let's pass this bill. I mean, six years, five different tries, took six years, so one year for every month of access we earned. <laughs> oh, that's a good anecdote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Taking perhaps a little bit more of a serious turn, uh, do you think part of the reason it got more support is not just because of the legwork that you've been doing, but also because of the political landscape that's changed? We're living um, in the Dobbs decision world yeah. where Roe Ro versus Wade is no longer the law of the land. Do you think that maybe persuaded some of your Republican colleagues to support birth control measures like this? Yeah, I think so. I think. Um, when Dobbs fell and we saw, you know, some of the most harsh abortion bans go into effect in the country in our state um, And we saw the fallout last session where people were really Clamoring for fixes in the legislation to allow for exceptions in abortion for the health of the mother life um, rape incest and so forth and we still in this state of Idaho the only exception for an abortion is certain death. And um, I don't really think the rape exception is an exception at all. It's really not worth the paper it's written on due to the practicalities of trying to get an abortion in the state. Having to get a police report, get everything verified. Have, yeah, you have to get a police report, get it verified. What doctor is going to put their name on a public document to say, oh, come get your abortion when you know you live in such a hostile state? I do think, too, it was a bridge too far when some of my colleagues started to say they were um, interested in um, maybe going after different forms of birth control, the IUD and other things. And um, I think some folks started to wake up that, hey, Republican and Democratic and Independent, regardless of your party, use birth control at, for family planning, and it's a very essential part of it. And I think some folks started to realize, hey, this is going way too far, and um, contraception is legal, and we should make it accessible. And I think in particular, when you have a state where people are reporting they're really afraid of being pregnant, um, we have lost a lot of physicians and um, experts in the field of maternal medicine, fetal maternal medicine. And so I think it, it really bodes well that we should at least open up and increase access to birth control. The legislature's also passed a few other bills related to maternity and, and mm -hmm. that sphere of policy with expanding Medicaid coverage postpartum, um, recreating the maternal, maternal Mortality Review Committee. I know it's hard to say. <laughs> a bit of a mouthful. Um, other than those two really notable bills, is there anything else happening in the policy arena that makes you hopeful about progress in this realm? Even if getting more abortion exceptions specifically, even if that's not on the table, is is good work being is good progress being made? You know, I'm really pleased to see that we finally did pass the extension of care for mothers from three months to twelve months. I mean, that's a long time coming. That should have been happening a long time ago. And um, I think it was a fight last year, and for whatever reason it didn't pass, but I'm so thankful to see that it passed this year. So again, that I think that bodes well that people are listening to the constituencies, like we need this care. And if you really do value life, then we need to value life. Um, I'm still, the jury's out for me on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee. I hope that, um, I hope the bill that we passed works. It's not quite as, um, the actual bill itself was a couple sentences granting the Board of Medicine the ability to create a team and then collect and review data. And the former law was quite thorough in appointments and authority and confidentiality. And so I'm hoping that 
that bill was enough and gave them enough authority to do it and that we don't have to come back and add to it. Um, I was a little skeptical. I voted for the bill, obviously, but um, just make, I hope, hopefully it actually works in the way we hope it will. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we, fingers crossed, are getting into the final days of the session here, what big issues are still outstanding that you think need to be addressed before you all head home? Well, I think in this area, people are still clamoring for a true health exception for mothers. Um, again, we've seen documentary after documentary in this last year of women leaving the state in a crisis pregnancy trying to seek care. We see Alabama outline IVF. Um, it's, le it's obviously legal here in our state, and I hope no one tries to go after that. Um, but I think the other thing that is kind of lingering that's going to be addressed that I'm not real happy about, but there are all these bills that have been attacking folks based on their gender and their gender identity. And um, I just don't think government should be in the role of telling people who they should be and how they should live their life and who they should love and what medical care they get. I think that's far overreaching. It's discriminatory and it's harmful to everyone. I mean, as a woman trying to get birth control for six months, um, I feel, you know, the repercussions of some of the ignorance around that. And I just hope that some of the ignorance around people who are just trying to live their lives and find comfort in their own skin, um, that that ignorance can be quelled and that people can go on living their lives in safety and peace. But some of the bills that have been introduced, I think, are quite troubling to the um, LGBTQ community in our state. And I guess for anybody who's listening out there, um, please know that there are people in the state house who care about you, who value you for who you are and are fighting for your rights every day. And I've heard too many people say they want to leave the state and I, I hope you'll stay. And um, we'll, we'll weather this storm and there is a place for all of us in Idaho. All right. Senate Minority Leader, Melissa Wintro, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support for Idaho Public Television comes from the School of Public Service at Boise State University, providing objective and impactful research for Idaho and beyond and academic programs with hands-on learning that equip students to be effective public service leaders.